Hi everyone, and welcome to the Mineral Council South Africa and Mining Review Africa's third instalment of thought-provoking interviews with some of South Africa's leading influencers and role players. Our topic for today is another relevant and current issue continuing to challenge the country's mining sector, communities. They can be your ally or your enemy, and finding ways to ensure a harmonious relationship can be easy or difficult. Joining me to talk about this topic in detail is Paul Dunn. Paul is the CEO of world-class PGM producer Northern Platinum. We're going to explore this topic to its core and really unpack the challenges, but also the solutions. I can't wait to get started. Paul, thank you so much for joining me today. Morning, Laura. So, Paul, I think the best place to start is looking at the overall picture, an overview, if you will. Can you just unpack for me, Paul, the mining industry's relationships with communities at present and perhaps what are the most common areas of friction and what is actually working between mines and communities at the moment? Answer that question by explaining that mining uh, companies generally, and I am generalizing here, tend to operate in more rural or, or rather remote areas of the country, as opposed to, let's say, Johannesburg and Cape Town. So there's a very, very important that we, we, we understand where we are with respect to those communities and where the communities themselves reside. They're not uh, the, the richest places uh, from a uh, community point of view to begin with. Uh, they are remote and rural. And uh, so the backdrop ag against many uh, many of the areas in which we operate is one of uh, high high unemployment, uh, high lack or, or a, a strong lack of economic opportunity, and also in those smaller towns and uh, areas where we are, there's also this is compounded by a distinct um, failure of local government and therefore lack of, 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 let's say, government service. And it's a whole range of services from, from uh, roads to water to power, um, um, medical clinics, uh, schooling, uh, sewage works. Uh, as you can imagine, it's the full gambit of, of local government that is not doing well. And many of these small towns are really, really struggling. And when you then compound that with high unemployment, in particular amongst the youth, or, and, and also lack of economic economic opportunities. So it's a it's a it's a difficult recipe uh, in which our communities are uh, are endeavouring to succeed and survive. Uh, they're just a bit fuller from our side. Um, you, you know, the mining the mining companies are uh, perceived, of course, and and they are large large companies, and they, and they are doing well, but they're not infinitely large, and they have a limit. Companies like ourselves have a limit in what we we can do. We can't replace government. Uh, we're just not that big. Uh, so what we endeavour to do is, on the one hand, create uh, employment opportunities, uh, and then on the other, through SLP endeavours and other endeavours above and beyond the SLP, that's the social license to operate, uh, social um, SLP program, a social and labour program. It stands for actually, but it, it embodies our social license to operate. We endeavour to supplement government um, with probably non-traditional areas of input uh, that uh, that mining companies would not normally do necessarily elsewhere in the world. So we do uh, we do uh, build schools as a very good example in uh, in uh, cooperation with the Department of Education. Thanks, Paul. And interesting how you say you know you can't supplements or, or you are supplementing what government should be doing but you know you do need that government support and you also mentioned SLPs and that's a very important topic that I do want to jump onto a little bit later so I'm glad you brought that up but I think leading on from what you've said Paul you know I think there's this perception that mining companies and their neighboring communities are actually often in in these exploitative relationships do you think that perception is accurate or why do people feel that way? No, it's not. It's not accurate at all. It's a, I do agree with you. It's a common a common lead in some headlining, but it's 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 not the full picture by a long, long way. Um, in, on the whole, for the most part, again, generalizing uh, mining companies and communities do coexist. 
uh, many of our employees come from the very same communities and uh, enjoy um, employment with our companies. So there's a great interdependency there. On the one hand, mining companies need need um, need the input from people to do what we do. We are a very people centric uh, undertaking generally, and um, mining companies need to be able to operate in in uh, and coexist inside those communities. Uh, to succeed, otherwise we wouldn't be able to mine. Uh, but of course, that's not in itself. That's only the sort of the positive part. On the negative side, we do have a lot of friction uh, on many many issues. Um, generally, by the way, again for economic opportunity, uh, employment, and um, procurement opportunities. Any any form of economic opportunity is of course uh, highly sought after, and there's a great competition for those jobs and for those uh, procurement opportunities because the need is just so great. Now we as mining companies have to distinguish between uh, genuine uh, efforts to secure those opportunities and the bad behavior uh, that we sometimes um, we sometimes experience. Raised uh, the word procurement in particular and you know I think there's this this common term in the mining industry around procurement mafia or business forums that that mining companies actually have to engage with in relation to these communities. So how poor do you think companies should manage relationships with these communities when they are cynically being used by forums to engage in protests and violence just so that these forums can extort contracts from the mines? Again, I think one has to distinguish between genuine um, representatives of the community and genuine leadership forums with uh, as opposed to pop up uh, uh, business forums, uh, which are not always uh, got the fullest um, um, the fullest um, representation amongst the broader community and uh, what the mining companies do do. We engage regularly and often with many facets of genuine leadership from those communities, but we will not engage with uh, with, um, shall we say, uh, opportunism. Which which does arise uh, regularly, in particular in this case on the procurement field. Uh, okay. Procurement has to be structured, well structured, and fair, and that's what mining companies do. And if we if we digress from that that uh, sort of very governed, rigorous procurement process, and and somehow give in or bow to pressure groups for business opportunities, this is very very slippery slope. And our management teams will not do that, even in the face of substantial uh, pressure and operational pressure sometimes. Uh, Paul, how do you get around that when these forums uh, become so insistent that they're not prepared to negotiate or, or do business the way it should legitimately be done? How do you get around that? We simply don't do business with them. It's a good That's way not to not to get business with mining companies is to behave in this fashion. Paul, if we look at the eastern limb, I mean, you are a PGM miner, this is obviously pertinent to your business in particular. The southern portion of the eastern limb, like most specifically, it seems to be a particularly difficult area for mining companies and their communities. Do you know why this is and, and perhaps what can be done about this particular situation? It's known, known as the southern cluster, uh, which is basically south of the of the Leidenberg or the Steelport Fault, uh, as we know it, geologically speaking, uh, and would encompass the areas uh, such as Leidenberg, which is and, and Maschersching, uh, which is another the, the the more recent name for Leidenberg. Um, I wouldn't say particularly it's any different uh, between the southern cluster and the northern cluster, both. Both uh, have their difficulties, and the uh, and the reason is uh, the large number of people living in that mainly rural area, where the only or one of the few centres of economic op opportunity is, in fact, the mining companies. There's uh, there's some agriculture in that area, and of course there are the small towns themselves. Um, but other than that, there's very little. There's little industrialization, uh, for instance. So there's there's not too many. You know, a lot of the manufacturing uh, uh, companies are still in the in either the coal fields or all the way back to Johannesburg uh, that service these areas. So it's very underdeveloped, and that means that the number of opportunities is just far too few 
against the number of people. And, uh, you know, we often quote the the broader youth definition unemployment, which is in excess of 50%. It's 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 very, very significant. Now, Boisendahl, which is our mine, employs in, in and around uh, or will employ ultimately in and around 7000 people. But there, um, you know, in the in the southern cluster area, there's half a million people, you know, so the you know, the 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 jobs are very, very important, but they're not sufficient to cater for everybody. And this causes genuine economic hardship uh, uh, amongst those communities. What is the solution? Is there a solution? Is there a silver bullet? I'm thinking not, because if there was, it would have been found already to sort of compensating or dealing with the fact that, you know, you can only do so much for those communities. How do we how do we get around it? How do we overcome this hurdle? So there is there is, as you say, quite rightly, there is no silver bullet. That's 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 a, a true statement. But but there are um, mitigating things that should and must be done. Uh, one is mining companies uh, are really good uh, for economy, e economic development. They're not, uh, you know, we we're not the most popular sector uh, generally among society, but but society often totally misrepresents and misunderstands what mining companies do. We are a, a genuine large force for good, in particularly in the Southern African and South African context, uh, where we still a developing economy. Uh, these companies are our primary industries, you know, right at the bottom of the economic triangle, as we always say. It begins at the bottom. And the, the, these companies are mining needs to be protected in that sense, uh, protected um, in the sense of, um, you know, government needs to maintain uh, basic law and order. Um, you know, uh, we should not be attacked all the time, as sometimes we are, by a, a general society. This is wrong. Uh, it is fundamentally incorrect to, to attack mining companies as much as we sometimes endure. Uh, it's, it's a total misrepresentation of what we bring to society. And uh, just again uh, to illustrate the point in the southern, in the South African context, can you imagine? Uh, you know, we all uh, worry about uh, the the value of the rand. Can you imagine the value of the rand if we didn't have mining? It would be a lot uh, lower than what it is uh, today. We are a, a pretty serious uh, import uh, um, generator of foreign uh, currency and foreign investment. So uh, mining is really important, and it needs to be nurtured, and I would even go as far as to say protected uh, by society, not not shunned as we sometimes uh, can be. Uh, and then the se the second thing I would I would bring uh, to the table is that government needs to do its job uh, again in in terms of um, the management of the lo local government uh, management, uh, the town management, uh, uh, and and the government fundamentally is failing here on many, many fronts. Um, and that and and that is, you know, it, the, the failure of government in the, in this context is very severe uh, because, um, you know, the impact on these communities is 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 felt daily. And then the third thing I would say is maintain basic law and order. Now that this doesn't mean um, uh, uh, policemen running around uh, with, uh, you know, with firearms and so on and so forth. That's not what we're referring to. It is me. It means that the the road network needs to remain open uh, every day. Uh, if the road network is blocked and in the uh, southern cluster, by the way, the road network is a radial network. It's not it's not it isn't a network. Actually, it's uh, it's single roads in and out. And if the, those roads are blocked, literally children can't get to school. Um, our employees can't get to work and you completely inhibit the economic firepower that mining companies bring. Uh, so, uh, you know, we do and have been working very uh, uh, behind the scenes, very, very well with the uh, with the police actually on this point uh, as a group of CEOs in the Southern Cluster. This would be uh, Anglo Platinum, uh, Arm, uh, Northern, uh, uh, Glencore uh, and and some of the Chrome guys, smaller Chrome guys, uh, we, we cooperate and we have been engaging with uh, with government rights in the presidency, actually, on the basic maintenance of law and order, and also bringing to the fore uh, the point that local government needs to work uh, for the people. 
course, some some really hard hitting issues presented there, but I think that's as in any time the starting point for to, to getting anything right is understanding what the challenges are and, and what the solutions could be. So thank you for that very honest and transparent answer. Paul, if we turn to social and labour plans, as you mentioned in the beginning, there's a lot that we can cover in terms of this. My first question is really around making them bulletproof and sort of acceptable and implementable. How can how can the mining industry do that? Yeah, I think a modern SLP uh, is an, is effectively a consultative document. So um, the contents of the SLP is has been consulted and agreed to already. Um, uh, they they run uh, they're a rolling five year program actually, and many people don't quite understand that. There's not one SLP. Every five years, the SLP is is uh, is renewed and uh, consulted upon amongst the uh, government and the communities themselves as to the particular need at the particular time in the particular area. Um, and um, what is also important to realize is the SLP, uh, the contents of the SLP, quite often require local government themselves as part of that delivery. So if we were, for instance, uh, I, I use the example of building a school, but let me do a different one. Let's say uh, if we um, if we were to electrify or bring water, we need we need permissions. You know, we can't just run in there and start and start building. Uh, there are yeah, and there, and what happens? There, I mean, for instance, there's a there's a bridge renewal that we want to do in the Steelport area. It's known as the Steelport Bridge. It's a bottleneck in the road network, and we want to double the size of the bridge. And what we don't need is is interference by government on procurement as to who then would do it. Uh, you know, it has to be done with proper governance and a proper tender, and whoever wins the tender should get the job, and there should be no other discussion. Uh, at the end of the day, the mining companies will fund that that road network improvement, and uh, quite often government is getting in the way. And what government needs to do, frankly, is get out of the way uh, in many of these instances. Interesting, Paul. <laughs> the word government and then how government interplays with all of these scenarios just definitely keeps coming up, which is already a, a takeaway for me. Continuing with SLPs, I think a lot of mining companies are not, uh, what's the word, actually making them public. They sort of keep them as internal documents or the, the public can't see these. Why do you think mining companies are doing this when it's such a, as you say, sort of a regulated document? Why, why is it so secretive? Well, in the, our our SLP is available, and many companies SLP is available. So I don't I actually uh, adhere to that statement. I think some people would like to use it and say mining companies are secret. If that's not the case at all, we publish an integrated annual report every year. It's all in there. Uh, just read it. <laughs> Brilliant. Not, oh. I'm not uh, directing that comment at you, Laura. I'm directing that comment at those <laughs> that wish you. again unfairly so to protect. For, for, Project mining companies uh, somehow wrongdoers and uh, and secretive. It's not the case at all. Fair play. I mean, this this interview is aimed at at unpacking perceptions and and what what of those are are not actually true or accurate. So, Paul, my last um, sort of question around SLPs is the ability for mining companies to to work together and collaborate to generate bigger projects for broader communities. What are your feelings around sort of that statement? Yeah, I support that statement. Uh, the, I'll just qualify it very, very slightly, is that the SLP is not the BN and, and end all of what mining companies do. The SLP is directly linked to the mining rights. It is a, you know, it's a supporting document. It's your license to operate. And there are, uh, you know, um, delivery items inside inside that SLP that are very di directly related to your your right to mine. The mining companies do much more than what is embodied in the SLP. Uh, some of those points I, I mentioned earlier are outside the SLP. So the the improvement to the Steelport Bridge again is a is a good a good um, case study where it's all the companies are going to con contribute to that bridge improvement uh, together, uh, working together in a very cooperative fashion, and contributing on a some sort of pro rata basis in terms of the size of the company or the production. Of the company, and uh, the comp we are, we are able to do that, and willing to do that. And the Southern Cluster has been quite good 
in coordinating efforts to do more collectively. And generally, those collective items tend to be outside the SLP because the SLP is very particularly linked to the individual mining rights itself. So it, it, what I'm trying to say, Laura, those sort of things tend to ha happen outside the SLP. Well, it's always they're, all, they're all articulated in the, again, I'll stress the integrated annual report. They're all in there. <laughs> so go and read those integrated annual reports. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a, it's a tough document and it's a long read, and, uh, but it is important. I mean, these, these reports are produced for a very good reason. It's for disclosure. Well, if I look at one other aspect when we talk about communities, municipalities actually come to mind. And, you know, some municipalities actually are functional, many are dysfunctional. And this pressure, it puts pressure on mining companies with the, communi the community relationships and enacting SLP. So what do you think about how municip municipalities play a role in this whole discussion around community situations? Yeah, I mean, I think I've mentioned some of the points already. Uh, the municipal uh, towns, uh, music, municipalities, local government, unfortunately, is really struggling. Uh, you know, they're struggling with finances, they're struggling with capacity, and they're certainly struggling with actual doing implementation if, or execution, as we would call it in, from a project point of view. Um, uh, and, um, and this is having a bad compounding effect on the dearth of economic, the underlying dearth of economic opportunity anyway, and it just makes life tough. Uh, yeah, I can't say that any more bluntly than that. Yeah, fair enough, fair point. So, Paul, something that we uh, that we've included for our interviews uh, as part of this collaboration that we're doing with the Minerals Council is to conclude by asking what you would do if you were president for a day. So I know you've outlined a lot of solutions as part of this discussion already, but maybe in summary, if you were president for a day, what three measures would you implement to assist mining companies and communities establish sound relationships? Yeah, I think first of all is move from a, a hard-headed confrontational stance to a cooperative nurturing stance and even protection of, of these uh, economic entities that we call mines. Uh, we have had some success with government on that, uh, to, be, uh, to be fair. I think in, in recent years, uh, the Industry Council, Minerals Council, of course, I'm referring to, have moved closer to government. We do do a lot of work with government uh, behind the scenes. Uh, not always in public. Um, we are we we con would consider that that behind behind the scenes work is quite effective with government. It's sort of an 80 20. You will see 20 percent publicized and in public discussion this this discourse with government. And then, but there's a there's a big iceberg behind that where we do engage with government uh, quite hard and uh, intensely to try and get things done. And it's fair to say that the uh, industry and government have become a little bit more uh, cooperative with each other and less hard-headed and confrontational. So this is a good thing. Uh, again, I would exemplify that with uh, some of the words from um, uh, President Ramaphosa on Monday night with respect to the electricity crisis. Uh, many of those inputs that industry made and the mining industry made have been considered and incorporated into that, into that plan. Uh, again, of course, we now must press for execution. Uh, it's it, it's good to have a plan, and it's a good plan, by the way. And we would give that plan a, at least a nine out of ten in terms of what needs to be done. Uh, so the plan is good, and we now need to e execute. And we will work with government uh, to 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 pull up to do our part. So yeah, I think um, yeah, I think that's that's the first one. The second one is you've got, we've got to get local government fixed. And, uh, you know, that that's that's a toughie, but local government is not working. In fact, it's the opposite. It's failing and it's and it's eroding. The capacity of towns is actually eroding by the day on all, in in all aspects of what you would expect from uh, municipal delivery. And then the third one is for sure uh, is law and order needs to, basic law and order needs to be maintained in the country and we are slipping in a number of areas. Um, I, again, I think um, the uh, commissioner, uh, Massimola, who's the new uh, police commissioner, who we have engaged with directly, 
when he was deputy police commissioner has a has a big job to do. There are a number of of, of elements of of uh, of law and order that are failing, uh, and, and some of them are more severe than others. Uh, the uh, the organized crime element, uh, the uh, the large number of weapons sometimes involved, and then you know on the ground a basic law and order maintaining, uh, ma making sure people can go about their daily lives without being harassed and interfered with. One more question from me, and those are three great points that you've raised. But can I ask, are you an optimistic man? Do you think these things can be solved, addressed, and, and we can move in, in a good direction that sort of brings improvement to this very big issue that we're talking about? I think mining people in general are optimists. I think that's fair to say, and I would class myself inherently as optimistic. Yes, I would, I would lean on that side. Uh, we're also very pragmatic and realistic, so we know the difficulties of what we're asking for, and it's not so easy. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, there is no silver bullet. This is a continual, a continual effort over time. The country is moving forward generally, but it could do so much better, uh, you know, with some of these things uh, addressed uh, more effectively. So that would be my summation. You know, one of the objectives of these these interviews that I'm doing is is really to to talk about the real issues, to be transparent, to be open and honest. And you've absolutely delivered on those fronts, Paul. So I can't thank you enough for that. And in the in the hopes of positivity uh, and optimism, let's hope that uh, we can see improvements in these areas, especially with com mining companies such as yourselves doing a lot of work and, and putting a lot of time and effort into these things. So thank you very much, Paul. Thanks, Laura. Goodbye. Cheers.